Hello everyone and welcome to our channel. In this video we have an interview with our sensei Najib Amin from the Shotokan Cry Club of Maryland. Uh, he's been training in karate since the 1960s and he's got uh, an incredible lifetime of experiences you know in and out of karate that we really wanted to share not just with our club but with kind of people that have met him more generally. His story is so exciting and so cool and we really hope you guys tune in. Be sure to check out a lot of the photos that I've kind of sliced into the video. We hope you guys like it so let us know what you think. Hello and thanks for um, joining us. Um, here I'm going to give a brief introduction uh, to our you know, very special guest for this interview, but I think through the interview we'll get to um, learn a bit more about um, him. But uh, for those that don't know, this is um, our sensei uh, Najib Amin. Uh, he is uh, Eitan uh, Shihankai in ISKF here on, in the East Coast region. Uh, he is a head instructor of this club, which is the Shotokan Karate Club of Maryland. We'll learn a little bit in our talk about the kind of history of that club. Um, and they've changed kind of names and locations a bit. This is where we are now. Uh, anything I'm forgetting immediately? Well, obviously this is, this is our home club. So we've been here yeah. training with Sensei since 2011. So almost 10 years. And um, you know, he's welcomed us like family. And uh, we're just very honored to be one of his students. Yeah. Um, yeah. And would, would you care to add anything to? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm good. You're good. <laughs> so far, so good. Okay, so I'll say that one of these people, you're very, you're very you know, humble and, and soft-spoken person. So you're, that that answer doesn't surprise me. So part of the reason for this interview is we want people, to, we want you to be able to share as much of your story as you can and, and stuff. Um, so we'll just kind of have a conversation. Some of these things, some of the questions we might know a little bit about, but. I think a lot of the questions I'm, um, you know, interested to hear or learn sure, more about. Course, yes. So, would you? And we're mostly talking about karate and your life in karate. But would you um, share with us briefly, you know, where you were born and like a little bit about your childhood and you know your your young sure. days? Yeah, well, I was born in Richmond, Virginia, March 29th, 1932, and uh, my parents left Richmond uh, when I was still an infant and moved to Baltimore. Okay. So my uh, my father's older sister kept me in Richmond. Oh wow! Yes, because uh, my my parents were kind of young and, and uh, she didn't want me in Baltimore. Gotcha. So I stayed there with her. And uh, but I, I came during the summers. I would come to uh, Baltimore when school closed. I would come to Baltimore and spend summers with my parents. Gotcha. And I stayed in Richmond until uh, I think one year of high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, then I left. I. Uh, Came here. I played football one year in high, my first year in high school. Oh, yeah. I didn't play, I was on the football oh, team. <laughs> I never got in the game. But uh, anyway, I came to Baltimore and uh, my first love was track. I, I ran really? track for Dunbar okay. High School. I also boxed for Dunbar High School. Oh, really? So they, yes. they, was boxing part of the school curriculum? Yes, they had no, boxing no, teams no, in no, high schools no. at that time. So oh. I joined the boxing team and I, it was a very funny experience. Uh, my first match. Uh, was with Carver High School. Okay. And at the time, I was just out fighting left handed. Mm -hmm. I, rounds were three minutes at that time. Now, amateurs only fight two minutes, but yeah. rounds were three minutes. Uh, I went out, I knocked the guy down in the first round, got through the first round. I came out, I knocked him down twice in the second round. I had no idea about pacing or anything like yeah. that. So when the bell rang for the third, <laughs> the third round, I stood up. And my hand like this. Oh no! So the referee came over to me. He said, "Look, you're tired, so I'm not you." I said, "Yeah." He walked over and another guy. Uh, <laughs> another guy. Another guy won the fight after all that. Oh you know? my God! And the funniest thing happened after being in the army, coming out, walking downtown one day, and I saw him. He saw me at the same time. Even though years had passed, we still recognized each other. We ran up to each other and embraced, and we started talking about this fight. That's it, was so, it was so funny, yes. Wow. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, I, I, I boxed with Dunbar. Yeah. When, that, it, when that happened, I realized that the coach for the Dunbar boxing team coached football, basketball, and boxing. Mm. But he knew mm. little about boxing, didn't care much about boxing. Mm. So I joined the Baltimore Athletic Association under Mac Lewis. Now, Mr. Mack, as everybody called him through the years, I'm sorry I didn't bring a picture of him because I have some pictures with him in my camera. Yeah. But anyway, uh, I trained there with him and uh, we, I did that for several years. And wow. then 
uh, in 1961, yeah. we moved to uh, Katingsville. Okay. And that's when I got interested in karate. Gotcha. And I was still trying to box at the time, but yeah. my next door neighbor, big fella, came out one day with his karate gi on his arm. Mm -hmm. And I saw him and said, hey, he said, where are you going with those pajamas? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he said, my pajamas, karate gi. Yeah. Wow. So uh, he uh, would come over, he worked at Sparrow's Point, and he got off at three o'clock. He would come over to my house in the evening, mm -hmm. in my basement, and teach me the fundamentals of, of what he had learned. See. We did this from like September to about December. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in December he came to me one day and he said, I can, can't teach you anymore. But the club is starting up at the Chick Webb Center in East Baltimore. And maybe we can go over and uh, train there. So he, another gentleman from Catesville, George Christian and I, the three of us would go over on uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays and train at the Chick Webb Center. And the gentleman whose picture is up over there, yeah. On yeah. the yellow key, he was instructor there. His name was Howard Eugene Stinnett. Uh, he had learned bits and pieces of karate. I mean, he wasn't really karate. We were doing all kinds of things. We yeah. called it karate. But uh, that was happened around the uh, early 60s, 62, 63. Yeah. yeah. And uh, anyway, uh, Bob, Bob McPherson came over one day and he had some karate training in Japan as well as judo. And we, saw, we were impressed with what we saw. So, uh, but anyway, Okazaki Sensei came down in the early 60s to do a demonstration. Mm -hmm. Now, Bob Lin, yeah. even as if you call out to Lord, Bob Lin, who was, uh, had a club in Highland Town at the time, okay. uh, they were all white. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We were at Chick Webb Center, which was an all black club. Yeah. And uh, Bob Lin worked for the railroad okay. to travel free. So, he heard about Okazaki Sensei being in Philadelphia and mm -hmm. got the train went up. Oh and uh, knocked on the door. He said, send me in the door. what do you want? He said, I want to talk to you about karate. He said, go away, come back again. So he went three times before Sensei would talk to him. Wow, really? traditional. Wow, yeah. yeah. Wow. And finally, he uh, got Sensei to come down and do a demonstration. Mm. And uh, that was done in one of the union halls. And after the demonstration, they sat down to have a meeting. And of course, that's when Sensei found out there was a club in the east side, as well as that club. And Sensei said, well, we don't teach karate. Like that. So you bring both clubs together mm -hmm. and then I'll come and teach. Mm -hmm. So both clubs came together. Bob Lent was the president of the club and Bob McPherson was chief of truck. You know, so that's kind of how it was organized. So uh, Okazaki Sensei would come down and teach class. Back then, classes were two hours, oh. teach from seven to nine. And uh, the organization was small, so we could keep him for much longer time. Mm -hmm. So we would take him to the train station. 9.30. Yeah. Last train left at 11.30. So we would give him a meal and he would sit down and he would pick his brain. Mm -hmm. We'd ask him questions about JKA and about Funakoshi Sensei and about Nakayama Sensei. And uh, he explained to us that he was trained as a kamikaze pilot. Mm -hmm. And it was scheduled for admission when the war ended. So he said it hadn't been for that. He said, I wouldn't be here today. Yeah. But that's kind of how things were at that yeah. time. Yeah. Um, then the next year, this was in 66, we moved the dojo from, from uh, the two locations and combined it to move to a 3101 Greenmount Avenue. Okay. Over a Clover Lynn's dojo and, and your dojo. Two combined, combined yes, one. yes. What, how, when was that? Around 66. 66, 66 okay. yeah, 66. Uh, I remember it well because Kisaka was a 1965 yeah. All Japan champion. Yeah. Now, from what I understand, back then, they had the, the, what they call the big four, the, the uh, Goju, Shito, Wado, and the Shogunai. And each of them, from my understanding, each of them would have a tournament. And then at the, they would culminate with one big tournament for the, J, uh, for the uh, Japan, for the yeah. old Japan, yeah. Japan. And Kisaka won that in 1965. Right. Okay. In 1966, he came to this country and he came over to. Uh, we called for black belt training in Okazaki since he came down and brought him with him wow. and introduced him to us. So we didn't know anything about him at the time. Uh -huh. And so the next time we called for black belt training, he came. And the way that we would we would call Okazaki since he'd ask him to come down half the time <laughs> and have enough money to, to, oh. pay, to pay his fee. Yeah. But he said, that's not important now. Wow. You know, I want to wow. teach. And so Kisaka came down the first time. Um, first time he taught, he uh, was demonstrating. Uh, a 
sad thing. It's really funny because he was standing against the wall and he comes later on like that, you know, and he says, understanding you, James, understanding. So what's wrong with that? He was explaining. And we were looking at each other. This man, is this man human? Pulling his leg, <laughs> pulling his leg out like that. Wow. You know? But uh, anyway, uh, he would come down periodically. Sometimes yeah. it was like a sense of recovery. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of how things got, got started. I see. Well, you know, I, I remember you telling me before the story about, you know, these two separate clubs, uh, the black club and the white club. Yes. And since it was like, like no, I'm not, not no, going to teach you, no, you're going to come together. No, but, and so the, if these two clubs did get merged around 65 or 66, yes. do you recall that? I mean, that's the 60s, and this is, right. I mean, the height of the civil rights movement era. Would you, yes. Do you recall that timing, whether that was, what was that time like either for the club, or was that ever... Do you recall that being something people talked about like outside the club, that it was no. a big thing for people to be trained together well, that way? Okazaki Sensei was a great influence. Mm -hmm. And he sat down with us. He talked to, to, talked to us about the principles of karate. And uh, he just diffused all of that. Mm -hmm. wow. So we never had a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, we trained hard, yeah. but we never had a problem with, in terms of race. Yeah. Never, never a problem. Okay. Okay. Huh. Uh, well, you, you covered a lot there in terms of you got a sense of who you, you know, how you started training. Um, you trained with there. Um, talk, you've talked a bit about Sensei Ozaki. Can you, um, so kind of a question we have, you've trained with him you know, for many years, but I guess a lot of this, there's I'm sure some training of traveling to Philadelphia to train with him, but also a lot of, he would come down every right. once in a while. I guess, yes. Trainings. Uh, do, you do you recall what some of your first impressions were of him when the first few times you got to train with him? Well, once we met him and started talking to people who had heard of him, about him, but we got to remember. Uh, first of all, Nishiyama, mm -hmm. in the early '60s, published his first book, mm -hmm. Karate: The Art of Hand Fighting. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, he had pictures of Okazaki Sensei, mm -hmm. and we would ask questions about that. Yeah. And uh, we found out that Okazaki Sensei never participated in the tournament. Right. And I assumed that people would say because he was head and shoulders above the other people, mm -hmm. he had no peers. In fact. Yeah. And. Uh, he wouldn't say things like that himself, but yeah. other, we got word of mouth from, from other people. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, but when he would come down, he uh, he was he would teach a class, and then he would observe the class and tell us where the strengths and weaknesses of that overall class were. Mm -hmm. So whoever Bob McPherson, Charles Greer, and I were the senior students at that time in the club. So he would call us aside and tell us when we teach to work on certain things. Mm -hmm. That was the extent of his personal, you know. Person in the interaction with us. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Um, but uh, we, we heard so many stories about him that it's almost like a legend. Mm. And back then, karate was so young that, that you know, we just didn't know. We, we, we grasped everything that came yeah. our way. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Uh, and I remember later on reading that he was the uh, instructor for the. Uh, one of the instructors for the first instructor training class. Mm -hmm. That's right, uh, yeah. He was in charge of everybody. I was, we were gonna ask you what led you to become an instructor, but I think like many people, you become an instructor sometimes out of necessity. If you're the senior person, yes. that fall, it falls to you. Um, well, since would you say that? Since they encouraged me to join. The okay, that was coming. Yes. So, so he encouraged you, to, did, that was maybe a question, did Sensei encourage you, did you need to form your own club? Or it sounds like there was kind of a club form at what point did you maybe take over teaching, or what role did maybe Sensei Kazaki have in encouraging okay. you to do the, the you what program? I was approached by the Y to teach. Okay. I was a brown belt at the time, and I had never, no teaching experience. Would this be down in Catonsville? Yes, in Catonsville. And uh, so I called Okazaki Sensei, and I said, you know, I've been asked to teach, but I don't know anything about teaching. I've never mm -hmm. had any experience teaching. He said, well, you get students in the dojo, you know more than they know. Teach them what you've learned. Mm -hmm. And I started with eight students, and John Elliott was one of them. Oh, wow. And we had, back, it was with the Western YMCA, mm -hmm. and we had eight week sessions at that time. Okay. So I taught eight weeks, and then we added a couple more. Mm -hmm. And eventually we got up to maybe 45 or 50 students. We had wow. a very large class at the wow. Banneker Recreation Center. Then we left the Banneker Recreation Center. Now that was with Catonsville Department of Recreation. I think it was the Department of Recreation at first. Then uh, we went left there and went to a, another location, went to one of the schools. And I was telling you earlier about the, the uh, having to get oh, jammed yeah, up. Oh, yeah, that was Well, yes. Um, we left there and went back to Banneker. We left, oh, left wow. our recreation department 
and went with the Western Y. Mm -hmm. So it was Western Y Karate Club for a while, and we went back to the Vanderbilt Recreation Center. Um, then the Y built a facility at South Rolling Road, and the fees went up. Mm -hmm. And I went to them and I explained to them that our fees, that our kids weren't able to pay those fees. Yeah. So we left and went back with the recreation. In the meantime, I taught a, a two credit course, elective course at Catesville Community College okay. for about 14 years. Wow. And I also taught uh, at the Y. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, I'm not sure exactly what year, but then we started with Brother Johns Hoffman. Oh, for Reed, mm -hmm. went to Hopkins from 75 to 79. Okay. And I think around 76, he started the club at, okay. at, at uh, Johns Hopkins. Was, was he the one that started that, that yes. club, got that yes. going? Yes, he started the club. Mm -hmm. And of course, when he left, I took it. Okay. And I kept it for a few years. And then Melvin Davis took it over. Mm -hmm. And when he left, uh, Jan, Janet Massey, the last, yeah. last few years. Okay. What do you recall with the. Um, so you started in the instructor training program at one point? Yes, right? so 1975. 75, you started yeah. the program. Yeah. Do you recall, what was the program like then? I, my sense is it, you know, like many things, it evolves or shifts over the years, but um, I've been in the instructor training program through the courses anyway, I've been graduated from it, but I know what it was like, you know, when I've been going through the classes, but what do you recall, what was the, uh, what were the classes like for the instructor training program? Pretty much the same. Uh, sensei, we more or less did the classes. Mm -hmm. Sensei was supervised, okay. and uh, he would, whatever the subject was, he would call someone out of the group to explain something. And uh, one of the things that was very difficult for me yeah. was being the only trainee in the class at that time. Mm -hmm. What I learned, I had to come back and impart to the students, mm -hmm. and particularly with Kata. We would learn a new Kata. And uh, I would stay after class and practice a little while. Then sometimes coming home, I would stop beside the road oh, and yeah. practice my car. I would get home and practice. Sometimes I'd get out of bed at night because I realized that if I didn't know the car, I mm -hmm. couldn't teach it. Wow. Yeah. And nobody else knew the car. Wow. <laughs> they knew the car. Exactly. So it was quite a burden, you know. Yeah. But, but I enjoyed it. Yeah, there was no, you know, uh, no computers and books and no, no YouTube, no, no videos. No film, no tape, nothing. So yeah. on the side of 95, you would just Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd hide behind my car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure people would pass and say, what is that idiot doing? <laughs> that's dedication. Wow. But that's how it was. And, and uh, back then, you could write a paper at any time. Mm. So sometimes guys would come in and just hand a paper in. The picture that I have in there was the first instructor training class. Oh, yeah. Now, Gerald Evans and Ronnie, Ronnie Johnson was the first student, Gerald Evans was the second. And Okazaki Sensei took them through the program. I would imagine to work all the kinks out. Mm -hmm. And then after, after they finished, they were the first two instructors. And after they finished, then uh, they started the whole, whole class. Oh, wow, okay. Sensei, I know that during this time, Freed was young and you were married. And what was your occupation during the time? What did you do for work? I worked for the Social Security Administration. Uh, I conducted, I started off as a clerk typist. Okay. Because in the Army, after basic training, I went to clerical school. I learned to type. So I started off as Social Security as a clerk typist. In fact, before I went to Social Security, I worked for the Internal Revenue Service. Okay. During that time, uh, Internal Revenue would hire additional people during the following period. Okay. So uh, I went to work for Internal Revenue as a temporary employee. And Manon, that's where I met Manon. Okay. Oh, I, I met Manon yeah. uh, on my birthday, the March 29th. Oh my gosh. We got engaged in August of the same year wow. and got married the same year. Wow. wow. December 31st. That's a big year. All in one year. <laughs> yeah. And celebrated, before she passed, we celebrated 63 years of marriage. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. Wow. But uh, in, in, at the Social Security Administration, I uh, worked as a clerk, clerk typist, and then uh, I got promoted a couple of times. And uh, the commissioner at that time was Commissioner Robert Ball. The facility that's on Woodlawn Drive now was built in the early 60s. When I went to work for Social Security, they were in the Canada Building, downtown Baldwin. In 61, they moved out there. Okay. Once, <clears throat> once the, tour, the commissioner, because the program, the, the building was constructed on with public funds, mm -hmm. the commissioner wanted uh, an you know, a tour program. Okay. So they started training tour guides. And one of the ladies in the tour program called me once and asked me if I would like to be a tour guide. And I said, sure. 
It was an eight-week program. Mm -hmm. We took the, took the training. Then they took us to Washington on a bus, and we toured the FBI, and okay. we toured the, the Capitol mm -hmm. and, uh, to see how tours were conducted. Okay. So we would come back. And then we took practice tours. We would have the, the supervisors take us on tour. Some of us made it, some of us didn't, of course. <laughs> uh, but eventually, uh, I got an opportunity to, to move in with the tour program, okay. to be, to be uh, one of the supervisors of the tour program. Okay. And during the course of that time, we had uh, 141 foreign countries came to visit Social Security. Wow. At 200, about 250,000 visitors. Wow. And there were tours twice a day. People could walk in off the street at 10.30 and 1.30, and they would sign a tour guide and go on tour. Wow. And that program lasted for quite some time. But in the early 70s, they started having problems with people, uh, computers, I people see. sabotaging computers. Sure. So they, they enclosed the computer section. And Social Security had the largest assembly of computers on one roof in the world at that time. Wow. And uh, but once they closed that off, and some other things started closing, mm -hmm. the tour program started to failure yeah. because there was nothing for people to see sure, at that time. Sure. Now, I remember you saying just in our private conversations that you worked, did you work the overnight shift at some point, or was that at a different place? No, that was downtown at the camp. Before we moved to okay. Wuhan, okay. Uh, I, I wanted a promotion. I was offered a promotion on the midnight shift. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that was 12 to 8, and I worked that shift for a while. But uh, it got to, it got to, in fact, they had only, they had two computer rooms, A and B room. The computers took up a whole room mm -hmm. because they had the tape drives and the computers, and they would uh, service one unit while the other unit was running. And uh, I left that job because I started in winter, but as the weather got warm, I would get off at eight o'clock in the morning and come home. During the warm weather, I lived in an apartment. The mm. children were outside playing. Yeah. <laughs> it was hot, no air conditioning, I couldn't sleep. Mm. That's said, no, I can't take this. So I gave the job up, got de demoted to the last grade I was. But sometimes, uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. And that's when Kareem was born, of course. He was born sure. in 1958. And, uh, uh, I was working the night shift, of course, my mom was working the day shift. Mm -hmm. But we worked together, I don't think I said that. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. we did work together. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I would come home at night, at midnight, and Fareed sound asleep, and as soon as I put my key in the door, Gay, can we? No. Oh. <laughs> that, that was quite an adventure. Yeah. yeah. And we moved uh, in 61, I think, okay. moved from the city apartment to what house where we are. Okay. So I was, the, um, was going to ask you about your work schedule with karate. So your typical, what would your typical typical day look like? So you would work at the Social Security Administration, then you'd go right to teach a karate class, or yes. what was your? Okay. Yes, uh, we started at some point. They started having uh, flex time. Okay. Initially, I worked seven thirty to four. Okay. But the flex the flex band was from six thirty to nine thirty. Okay. When it was 6 30, you got off at 3. Okay. So I would always go in early. Sure. Work the early shift. And that gave me a couple of hours to, to relax and get ready to teach class. Okay. And the, the place where I taught was only a block and a half from my house. Oh, nice. The Banneker Recreation Center was just down the street from me. Okay. So uh, it was very convenient for me to, to go there. Did you, were you training for very long before your son Fareed started training? No, he trained oh. along with me. Oh, he yeah. always, okay. Yeah. yeah, I started him at around 4. Okay. He, he was the kind of boy that wanted to do everything Daddy did. Yeah. You know? yeah so uh, I would take him with me, mm -hmm. and of course that would give my mom some, some relief as well. Sure, that's so true. this little boy could be in two or three rooms at the same time. <laughs> <in the house. laughs> you know? uh, he was all over the place. He yeah. was energetic. Yeah. 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 But he stayed. He stuck with me, and uh, every time I went, he would go. Wow. Out. Yeah. yeah. So he loved it. Yeah, so I mean, it wasn't as though you trained for two, three, or five years, and then for he started. No. Mostly from the he time started you with started, me. yeah, he started with really starting yeah. to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Well, I realized that. That's cool. I think it was That's one of our questions. Yeah. That's really yeah. cool. Sensei, what was your um, thinking about your early training? I've never heard a story about like your shodan exam or your test for black belts. But what, what were those like? Pretty much the same as they are now. Okay. Um, but. A little more intense, you know. We didn't have gloves. Okay. We sparred. We busted each other up. Mm -hmm. you know. But uh, I failed my showdown maybe two or three times. Oh really? Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Because I didn't have anybody to train me. Sure. So I was training on self self training for the most part. Sure. And there are a lot of fine points that I missed by not having an instructor. You know. Mm -hmm. 
So I failed a couple of times. Mm -hmm. The day I passed, I got that letter. Because since he was writers at that time, okay. you can pass the exam, so and so mm -hmm. So when I got that letter, boy, I was in seventh heaven. Uh -huh. <laughs> Showed up. Yeah. Wow. So we had a, I went 65, I went to Hartford, Connecticut to a uh, tournament. Okay. And uh, Masuyama was there. Oh, wow. Koichi Tohei from Aikido was there. And uh, anyway, after the tournament was over, um, Masoyama had just published a book called What is Karate? Have you ever seen that book? I, I think I have. Yeah. I don't have read it, but I, I, I... Well, I had a copy of the book. Huh. And after the tournament, the uh, Calypso group was supposed to come on and perform in the auditorium. And the stage manager asked me if I was with the Calypso group, and I said yes, and I had a book under my arm. And people were standing lined up around the block waiting for his autograph. I was going to step in front of him. <laughs> 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 he autographed the book and I walked in. I can feel the, I can feel the eyes on him, man. Uh -huh. I out of it, but I got out of it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I also had an opportunity to see Mr. Yamaguchi, the cat. Oh, yeah. Yes, at a Goju tournament in New York. Wow. And uh, I went to see my, my neighbor and I went to see that. And uh, as we were leaving, went backstage around the back. As we were leaving, Mr. Nishiyama, Okazaki and Kisaki were all walking with him. Mm. And, you know, we we didn't realize that people, you know, in Japan lived close to each other. We thought, you know, that he was this sound and he lived here and somebody else lived there. And so I walked up to Sensei and asked him, I said, you know, Mr. Yamaguchi, so yeah, should I go to the same neighborhood with Mr. Yamaguchi? Wow. So, but uh, that was quite an experience too. Yeah. Yeah, seeing him. Let me tell you a story of Shodokan. Sure. Yeah. This I was telling you about this tournament in, with uh, Masuyama. Yeah. Well, the, this young man who won this tournament and another young man got together, two different styles, and they, they opened a school in Hampton, Virginia. This was before uh, Foley got there. Yeah. But anyway, uh, had a demonstration once. I was still practicing Zen at the time, mm -hmm. and uh, I wish I wish I had shown had saved this poster. They had a big poster there. And they had on the, with the names of the people there, they had Santa Joan, Zen Buddhist of Shotokan Karate. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, it was in a high school auditorium. I practiced my side karate. I know I did that karate 200 times. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, every time I think about my side practice of karate, mm -hmm. bought a brand new gi, went down there, and the, the, uh, when I came up, they had the lights put out and put a spotlight on. I built the Maasai back cover. There's a gentleman named Daniel Pye, P-Y-D, Daniel Pye. He was a 10th town black belt. Okay. He was a feature there. Mm -hmm. Some of the stars, some of the people were doing some things that I've never seen before. And uh, when the uh, match was, when the, the demonstration was over, people were coming to me asking, what style was that? Because mm -hmm. these are all soft styles. And I said, show me kind. And he would pass, pass with asking me to autograph. I don't yeah. think about it and give them about an hour <laughs> I was just rambling up the time. Yeah. Wow. So anyway, that following spring, my friend McPherson and I went to a tournament in uh, Northern Virginia, and Daniel Pye was the chief, chief instructor. So we're sitting up in the audience, and I hear somebody say, Good old man! Good old man! He's pointing to me. He said, yeah, come down here. He wanted me to rescue the final match. I said, I've never refereed a match in my life. He said, well, if I say you referee, you referee. I said, oh, so Riley Hawkins, who has a club here in Baltimore, he yeah. avenges. Yeah. He's been around for years. Yeah, yeah. He and Jose Jones, you heard of Joan Reed. Mm -hmm. Well, Jose Jones was one of Joan Reed's top, top students at that time. Mm -hmm. And these two fought in the finals. And I refereed the finals and Riley Hawkins won. Mm -hmm. For that first first experience I've had refereeing, yeah. I was so nervous. I didn't know what to do. Because I didn't know what to do. Yeah. But I said, well, I'll imitate what I've seen my instructors do. Yeah. And that's how I got through it. Gotcha. Yeah. Wow. Yes, that's not an easy way to judge for the first, to center ref for the first time. Yeah. You know, just to be asked, oh, <laughs> yeah, please do this. Um, actually, that, that's a great, um, as I'm looking at uh, a question here with you on tournaments. Um, so, a question about tournaments. You're, you know, for people that are in ISKF, if, you know, maybe people have that aren't from Maryland but part of ISKF have seen you at tournaments and camps and, and see you as a, a referee or ju a chief judge very often, and often you're you're the chief judge or referee at the tournaments. Um, I was wondering if you would talk about what what do you see in terms of the strengths or weaknesses of tournaments, 
how or else you know how have they um, evolved or what, what's what's different about what you recall from tournaments you know when you started versus now but for me I'm kind of interested to think about to hear your insight into what it what is a you know strength and reason why people might choose to compete what they get out of it and what is the drawback what's a weakness of, of doing too much competing or if you don't have a good mindset for it. when I first started uh, we used to we had Maryland tournaments and then we would have our East Coast tournament. We t we had those tournaments at a place called uh, 34th and Spruce. Um, in Philadelphia? Yeah, part of the University of Maryland, Uni Maryland. University of Pennsylvania, right across okay. from the hospital. Yeah, yeah. It was an auditorium. Okay. And we had all the tournaments were on the stage. Hmm. Oh, wow. And the Bunk, I mean, uh, I think of the word. Joe Guy. Joe Guy oh. was the orchestra pit. Oh. <laughs> so you guys were playing all of a sudden one disappeared. Oh, no. That was Joe Guy and there was no Koketsu. <laughs> Just one time a year. <laughs> yeah, that was it. But but during that's that time that's different. we didn't have a lot of fancy techniques. Yeah. Uh, what I can little things like that, it can keep going. A strong Mai Gary, a strong Gakazuki, but but those techniques were, you know, you had to be a strong technique. Uh -huh. Of course, we didn't have gloves, yeah. so uh, we wound up, you know, busted lips and, and, and toes busted, this, this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, it was very difficult, yeah. you know, um, but I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. The reason I would go together, and uh, a couple of times we came back with broken toes, mm -hmm. and the hospital up here, uh, Northwest General, mm -hmm. was at that time the Baltimore County General Hospital, and we were hobbled in the hospital together. <laughs> That would tape two toes together, wow. let's go. And on one occasion, the same doctor was on call. It was Sunday evening, the same doctor was on call. He saw us hopping down the hall. He said, What's broken this time? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but as, as things went on, I think uh, it became a little bit more technical. Yeah. The people started a little, 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 little bit more finesse, uh -huh. people trained differently. Right. Because uh, back then we trained for two hours mm. and everything was just hard. Hard, hard. Yeah, 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 yeah. There was nothing, nothing pulled. We just stepped in. As time went on, things began to develop a little, with a little more finesse. Yeah. And, people, yeah. People, and of course, when the gloves came into existence, uh, that the first time we used gloves, I think we were having a she eye you know, in uh, Philadelphia. People started yeah. using uh, yeah. techniques, you know, things like that. Yeah. Plus, uh, if you attack, if you hit somebody, in a contact was occurred, they didn't dis disqualify you so easily. They would stop, make sure the person was all right, and yeah. you, if you wanted to continue, let you continue. Yeah. Now, of course, they stop, and mm -hmm. you, know, you get disqualified, and you get the mm -hmm. rules. They, they, they observe the rules now more yeah. than they used to. So you think that the, the technique has maybe improved a bit, at least the, the cleanliness of each individual, individual yes. techniques has, yes. has maybe gotten better, but but earlier it was, it was the, what hit you wouldn't look as pretty, but it would be very, very heavy. Yes, right? yes. It was harder, mm -hmm. yes. And there was no joke guy. I mean, you could run all over the place. Oh, really? you know, they'd pull and call you back in, but they wouldn't penalize you for it. Hmm. Oh, interesting. So in time, the rules began to change. Yeah. You know, so uh, uh, it became more controlled. Yeah. Than, than, uh, I see. Than it was. Than it was yeah. Yeah, this relates to your, you know, I, interesting how you, in talking about tournaments, you began to talk about like training and how training has kind of shifted or responded to tournaments and, and how we do tournaments is, you know, a response to our training. And so uh, I was wondering if you talk about, you know, anyone watching this knows generally what training is like today. So, you know, we've heard different versions or stories of what training used to be like, but I'd like to hear from you, at least with, um, when you started, you know, JKA training under Mr. Hizaki, um, what was uh, what did training mean? What, what was training like for you as you as you were starting in this art in the sixties and seventies when it was very new? Uh, it was fun. Yeah. I mean, we trained hard, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of camaraderie, yeah. and uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, fashion, of course, back then were two hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we trained for an hour, take two or three minutes break, and then train for another hour, and uh, everything was hard. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing was. You know, nothing was handed to us. Every, we had to earn right. everything we got. And even even exams, uh, you really, really had to buckle down to get, to get to pass it, particularly yeah. at the showdown. 
and uh, it's, it's, it's really difficult. I think people now are leaning more towards getting points in, in tournaments than doing good, doing good cards. Mm -hmm. And uh, people score a half a point and run around the base. Well, we, we had meetings of the technical committee to try and get rid of some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, people do that now, we'll, we'll warn them, don't mm -hmm. do that. Uh, but it's becoming more sport mm -hmm. than it is ludo. Mm -hmm. and, and we have meetings about that and we're trying to, to try and correct that. But as the organization gets larger, it becomes more and more difficult to control sure. because uh, not, not all of the instructors have been through the program mm -hmm. and uh, they don't know what some of the rules are. People do things different. For example, in kata, mm -hmm. we find that uh, uh, people sometimes embellish a kata or put moves on a kata that aren't actually there. Mm -hmm. And that's what they were taught. And that's what, yeah. that's all they know. Mm -hmm. So that's what they do, you know. Yeah. And when they're penalized for it, then they don't understand why. Mm -hmm. So as an organization gets larger, it's more and more difficult to control the rules. Yeah. And even though you may have the same rules for everybody, people interpret them differently. That's true. Sure. People want to go off in, in their own direction because everybody, yeah. everybody wants to be a boss. Everybody wants to be a. <laughs> yeah. Well, that actually, that uh, this might be what you're going to ask is um, being your students for the past nine, ten years, and having you on the side and watching us. We've noticed that you've had, you have just one of the best eyes for detail that like, we, you know, yeah. and even, you know, we, we, we've been training for a while now, but we get the sweats when you're watching us because yeah, we know. Man, that, well, <laughs> what's he thinking? We know you don't always that. tell us, but we know that you're probably thinking, well, why is Barry doing that? I won't watch it. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, please, please. No, 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 we, we just want to know, um, I, you know, just how do you develop that ability to, to see that in your students? You know, sometimes when I watch other instructors teach, they see things um, that I didn't see. And it's just, is that just a matter of time? And, and yes, you know, time just, and experience. Okay. We were in, uh, preparing for an instructor training class one day, and uh, since they came in the dojo, somebody was doing take a show down. Since they walked back and came out, said they made a mistake. Just like that. And they were filming it. They filmed, mm -hmm. played it back and showed it. I mean, he picked it up just like that. Mm -hmm. He was that astute. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But over the years, I guess, um, and to being on a technical committee, mm -hmm. and we review the cutters, and one of the reasons we, we, we're doing that, we did that, because the books, Nakayama Sensei's books, as good as they are, some of the techniques are not clearly defined. Mm -hmm. For example, in uh, Niju Shiho, this technique, mm -hmm. when the person who's demonstrating does that, his back is to me. Mm -hmm. So you can't yeah, see that. You don't, know what, you don't know what he's yeah. doing. So that's why we tried sure. going over to Cardinals and trying to sure. unify them, so we get rid of some of those things. Back to your, uh, when we were talking about what training was like earlier, and you had mentioned they were two hours long. Was it all Kihon, did you, with just the typical line basics up, up and down the floor? Kihon and Kata. Yeah. And we did, in fact, <clears throat> we didn't spar in the dojo. Okay, well. I mean, we didn't free spar. Okay. Never free spar in the dojo. All we did was eat bone. Uh, go home, sound bone, and you won't commit that. Oh, wow. Okay. And semi free. We just mm -hmm. knew okay. But we never did free spot in those days. And our tournaments were pretty sharp and crisp for the mm -hmm. most part. Mm -hmm. Because the basics that we learned in the dojo were the basics that we did in the tournament. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Know? And it was strong and, you know, mm -hmm. very, very, very strong techniques. Yeah, so all, you, all you're trained to do then is to step in that's hard right. and strong. So yeah, that's, that's what everyone's true. always gunning at each that's other true. very yeah. strong. You didn't pull anything, you know. I have kind of a question really sure. related to, um, I hadn't thought of it till, till just now, but when, so it's about kind of again training under, the, you know, learning from these Japanese instructors or, then, or at least like a Japanese martial art um, early in it being introduced to the US. During that time, what, for us when we were coming up, it was kind of taught that there's, you're learning uh, martial art, but you're also getting a little bit of Japanese culture, a little bit of Japanese social kind of norms that are part of your training. There's, yes. there's ways you behave and ways you don't behave right. that is you know, coming from Japanese culture, and thus it's part of dojo training. Yes. Well, we all were kind of taught that, and it seems very normal for you know people like us where our instructors and seniors came through a Japanese dojo right. and, and that they learned that. But as I'm thinking about it, when in the 60s, when these, when these instructors are coming over for the first time, what was 
was there a process? Because in a way, I imagine some of those cultural norms may have mattered more to these Japanese instructors in terms of here's a way you, you know, when they're teaching, in other words, you don't ask a question as a student. Right. You train, you don't talk, yes. but that would almost be disrespectful yes. to kind of raise your hand, or things like maybe sitting or leaning against a wall could be a big deal. Absolutely. Um, or just the idea that when you have, you know, a guest instructor, usually that you, then you have a responsibility to kind of care for that person, maybe yes. taking them to eat or your yes. doing things. But there's a lot of those kind of norms that you, people here born in the States wouldn't know unless they're taught them. Do you recall, like, how did that, those norms kind of get passed on to the first generation of, like, American karate ka, like well, yourself? Like, one you know, of the things, uh, when we, you know, I told you earlier that we used to sit down with Gokusaki Sensei, yeah. and he would tell us stories. Uh, uh, he would explain to us what the dojo kun was about mm -hmm. and what, what, how we should conduct ourselves, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, for example, like you, like you just mentioned, if we were sitting down uh, waiting for something, and lean against the fence, I mean, against the wall. They would reprimand us for that. Mm. We couldn't do that. Uh, Cesar was always a certain way. You couldn't slouch. You had to mm. sit properly. Um, I remember one occasion we were on Greenmount Avenue, and uh, student. One of the students had a friend uh, who was a kendoist, and the way we were situated, I was. I was. Kisaka was teaching. I was beside the door, and I couldn't get up a ride, and. Uh, young man came upstairs, the person behind me was a friend of his. He must have looked in his direction. I heard this, head straight! He stopped and slapped him and made him sit in the sales opposition for two hours. Oh, wow. And everyone's proud him to do that to make sure he was sitting, sitting in the sales opposition. Wow. That's, you know. That's the way you learn. Yes, that's the way we learn. Wow. You know? And one of the good things for me personally, I was in my 30s when I started doing karate. So I started a little bit late, you mm. know. And so he never bothered me. Oh. But I remember he would come down and tell us, uh, for example, he would teach a class, Bob McPhist and Charlie Green and I were the three seniors in the class, and he would call us aside at the end of the class and tell us they need to work on more, more basic, more of this, more of that, you know. And that's what we would try to teach in between times when they were here. Um, but that's how we, and I remember once, uh, I was very enthusiastic. I trained all the time. And once I began teaching, of course, the techniques apparently began to slip through. And one day, uh, Kisaka said he was teaching a class, and he walked over to me and he says, You know, teaching Tai Chi. He could tell. He just, just got these, just got quick. Wow. Yeah. And they, they were very precise about everything, mm -hmm. you know. And they stressed the dojo kun. Sensei would talk to us about it. that's most of what we learned. We learned from him just talking okay. to him. Mm -hmm. He never, he never taught us very much. I mean, he taught classes, but we would ask questions like, uh, you know, how do I perfect this? How do I improve this technique? Well, he didn't know much English. But all he would say was, "Keep training, mm -hmm. just keep training, keep training." I said, "Well, you know, I'm saying to myself, I'm saying to him, yeah. I'm saying to myself, well, I, I, I am training, <laughs> but, but what do I need to be doing?" Because when he first came to this country, of course, I mentioned to you earlier that Ronnie Johnson was his mentor. Okay. And uh, Ronnie taught him, you know, the American way of life, so to speak. Well, he didn't speak any English. And he used to tell us stories about going to restaurants. He didn't have much money. And if they would have him a menu, he would point. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the stuff they brought him, he could hardly eat it. <laughs> but he didn't have any money, he'd have yeah. a choice. So, yeah. so we had to wow. get that, we had to make do. Yeah. It was very hard for them. Yeah. I imagine. Yeah. yeah, language, cultural barriers, it's different, yes. you know, you don't know, just, just get, getting around, it's right. like, uh, when you think about it, how, how did they begin, I don't know how they I don't began. Either. The I don't know, yeah, he didn't have the music down mm -hmm. it's very difficult. Sensei, what do you like most about karate training? I mean, it's been something you've done, you know, most of your life. It's, it's just fun. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the, the, uh, the challenge mm -hmm. of, you know, our bodies weren't designed to do this. Mm. I mean, our sensei said it's all natural. Movements are all natural. That's what he said. But, <laughs> <laughs> but see, that's not quite that simple. Yeah. But I just enjoy it. It's just the challenge because as a boxer, of course, you know, I learn, you know, guys have to challenge and he's, he's uh, trying to take your head off. Mm. You're trying to defend yourself to keep you from doing that. So in karate, I, I, I find that, that the discipline, the focus, um, 
trying to imagine when I'm out, trying to imagine in situations what I would do if such yes. and such happened. And I think it's the combination of those things really mm -hmm. that, that keeps me interested about it. And then uh, teaching is fantastic to me because uh, I insist that teaching is one of the greatest learning experiences in the world. You know, if I've got three people on the floor, each one of them is different. You know, they have different body types, different attitudes, and all of this. And you've got to be able to impart the information to everybody so that everybody gets something from it. Mm -hmm. And that's a challenge. Yeah, it's a real absolutely. challenge. Yeah, yeah. Um, I taught a class last Friday, and uh, the three didn't show up. And there weren't four or five people on the floor. But I taught a very basic class. And nobody was breathing hard when they finished. But uh, if some of them talked, I'd be a little bit sore the next yeah. day. We lowered the stance and we did little things that they weren't used to doing. I sort of pushed them a little bit. But uh, it's just a pleasure to see people learn. Mm -hmm. And now, after these years, I have people come back and talk mm -hmm. to me about the training that they got. Mm -hmm. and, and I've got a letter right there on the wall. Mm -hmm. This young man trained. There was a hospital down on Liberty Heights, it's closed now, but Desmond taught a class down there with four or five people. And after the class was finished, one of the young men decided to come out and train. Mm -hmm. And uh, he stayed with me, he got his, he showed up, he got his knee down, and he became interested in Japanese culture. Mm -hmm. He went to Japan and uh, studied over there, and uh, eventually he got to the point where he could speak fluent, speak fluent Japanese, and he was teaching Japanese to English-speaking people and English wow. Japanese-speaking people. Wow. And he came by to see me a couple of years ago and spent about four hours with me oh, wow. talking about his experience that's in Japan. Cool. But that's, that's, that's the reward yeah. that we get for doing this. Yeah. You know, I meet people that I don't even recognize anymore. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I said it with you so and so and so and so. You know? mm -hmm. And it's just a delight because it's a character builder. Mm -hmm. you know? And that's what we try to spend yeah. the building of character. And I've only had to put out I think two or three students in all the time I've been teaching. Mm -hmm. Generally, that's 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 my joy. Yeah. That's why I have all those pictures in there. Yeah. yeah, my babies. Can, I know, and, and you can see just just the smile on your face yes. when you talk about your students. Yes, it's really yes, special. Yes, yes. And I've had some very special people. That's, yeah. that's my joy. Yeah. And you talked about karate being a challenge. Um, you know, a challenge that you enjoy. Is there anything that was hard for you to overcome in your karate journey? Whether it be physical or mental or I can't think of anything specific. Uh, <laughs> all of it was hard. You know? <laughs> no, <sorry. laughs> Nothing was easy. Yeah. yeah. Because first of all, I'm not the most flexible person. Okay. Ever. So having not having the flexibility to do some of the things as well yeah. as I would like to, that was quite a challenge for me. Okay. Uh, I tried to overcome that by being a little stronger mm -hmm. uh, rather than flexible, you know. Yeah. Uh, but try to find ways to compensate. Sure. But that's sure. one of my one of my biggest uh, problems. You, do you have a, um, a favorite technique or some of the technique you were known for or, or a least favorite technique like when you were? No, you know? I, no, I just, I try to make them all my favorite yeah. technique. Yeah. Right yeah. No, I don't have a favorite technique. Um, techie sound is my favorite color. I love techie sound. Yeah. yeah. And I think maybe I like the techie colors because most of the hand techniques. Okay. And because I boxed. Uh, so, okay. you know, so I have the dexterity to you know, put my hands to since I, I, just to kind of talk about something we had touched on earlier and that it just came to my mind, was did your boxing career, your sparring and boxing kind of help you in the ring for karate? Like, you know, as a karate player, that when I started to compete, that's my first time in a ring with a referee, but because you had the background in boxing, do you feel that that helped you in your sparring? No, not no? really. Okay. Because uh, I remember <laughs> the first time I sparred with somebody, the person had some experience and was getting the better of me. Mm. I got up on my toes and I started jabbing. Oh. Guy stops it. It wasn't a tournament. Okay. It was in the dojo. Guy stops it. Oh, you can't do that. You gotta, you gotta do karate oh. technique. So I'm trying to defend myself. Yeah. <laughs> I do whatever I have to do to keep yeah. this guy off me. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. So it took a while for me to make the transition. Sure. Yes. Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> and do you, would you say that you're still more um, likely to use your hands or do you, because you were a boxer? Yes. Or, yes. Okay. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. So I, I wonder if, um, was it harder for you to learn distancing when you were kicking and things like that? Because it was. you were so used to, yes. sure. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, I would kick through. Yeah. Rather than stop it. You know? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 
which is a wild thing. And I know um, just from knowing you personally, you have a workout daily workout routine mm -hmm. where, you, where you continue to stay fit. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, I, I have a machine called a ROM, mm -hmm. which is an acronym for range of motion. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was going to a chiropractor this in, in January, it would be 20 years I would use this machine. Wow. But anyway, I was going to a chiropractor and, and getting uh, what he calls subluxation of, of the exercise. He was doing an exercise with my back. But anyway, he said there's a guy on First Road has a business with machines up there. You might want to try it. Well, he was doing it. Mm -hmm. And I started doing it, and I just sort of fell in love with it. Mm -hmm. And I continued to do it. And once the business shut down, what of us got together to purchase the machine. The machines cost $15,000. Oh, wow. big machines. So four of us got together and purchased a machine and rented a space in an office building on Frederick Road, which is about three or four blocks from my house. Okay. And so I started going down there. So I go every morning now. When mm -hmm. I get up, that's my, my first chore is get on the machine. And what, what type of exercise is it? Just to give us some. This first, the front part is rowing. Okay. You know, you got the idiot sitting on. And the bar, handlebars come up and out like that. So you have to pull them all the way back. Okay. Here and back out again. And you set it, the settings are from about 100 pounds to 250 pounds. Okay. And it's only four minutes front, four oh, minutes wow. back. Okay. So you're pushing and pulling mm -hmm. 250 pounds for four minutes. Mm -hmm. Then the back is stair step. Okay. And it's three, three, uh, 36 inches. Wow. You're pushing. Uh, and the panel bars are here. Okay. Wow. So 36 inch steps. Yes. Wow. Yeah. And you do that, you said four minutes? Four minutes four front, minutes. four minutes back. So eight minutes every yes. line. Eight minutes wow. Back, yeah. Sometimes you have some time. Uh, I'll take you around. Yeah, we'd like that. Yeah, that would be cool. I showed you a picture, but I think didn't I? Oh, I haven't, I haven't seen I'm not a picture sure that I've seen it. Is it. Twenty years that you've been doing this machine. Mm -hmm. every January year? will be twenty years. Wow, that's cool. Oh man, <laughs> you can't really get a good yeah idea what it looks like from that picture, but that's funny. So and you said you were going to a chiropractor, and then have you? Um, did this help alleviate the, yes. the pressure that yes. you were feeling? Yeah. I was at uh, summer camp. You ever hear of Elaine Moyer? They call her Nudu. Sounds familiar. Yeah. She's a doc doctor? No, no, she, uh, she's karate girl. Okay. She's on that picture in there. Okay. Uh, we were at camp once. Okay. And uh, we get ready to go out in the morning to run. And there was a chair blocking my way. And I reached over and it went. Oh. Back. So I went, you've heard of Dr. Street a bit. He wrote the book about yeah. the doctor since well. Mm -hmm. He was a camp doctor. So okay. I went to him and he manipulated, manipulated, and didn't do any good. The night before, at that time I was staying in the, in the uh, infirmary. Mm -hmm. The night before, we were sitting up talking. There was a guy from Ohio there who was a chiropractor. Mm -hmm. And I literally called over to, to his cabin. He said, man, I can't, I can't stand up. He put me on the bed on one of the bunks. And, Took the needle, pushed the needles through my head, and I stayed. I went to sleep. I got up, went out, and I ran. Oh my goodness! And I stayed for the whole week. Because back then, we certainly so, uh, during uh, instructor training, you had to stay in oh, camp for whole, two whole weeks. Oh wow! And I stayed the whole week in training. But eventually, I began to have a little bit of soreness. So okay. I started going to chiropractor. Okay. And now I wake up in the morning with a little bit stiff. But when I get up in the morning, before I, before I get out of bed, I do fifty minutes. So I guess my practice, but then I get up, I do the exercise. And once I loosen up, I'm good to go. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm That's okay. All right. Um, so we talked about your favorite kata. And so I guess one of our questions is what motivates you to continue to teach and come to the club? And I guess that's your students. Yes. That yes. Yeah. yeah. One of the, the final questions is, uh, you know, what advice do you give to new students? Well, I like to, first of all, I like to explain to them what karate is because mm -hmm. the media has not been very kind to us. Mm -hmm. So I like to explain to them what it is, and particularly with the children. When a parent brings a child in, the first thing I ask the parent is, do you want to do this for him or does he want to do it? Yeah. If the child doesn't want to do it, I'll discourage him from bringing it. Yeah. Do something else. Yeah. Do karate. Uh, but I try to explain, I go, I go through a little bit of history and background to try to explain to them that uh, we're not teaching your children how to fight. Mm -hmm. We're teaching your children, hopefully, how to control situations so that fighting becomes a last resort. But we're also teaching them a fighting system whereby if they're 
attack, they must defend themselves as best they can. That's right. But that's the what I try to impose upon. Press upon the parents sure. uh, when they bring children, and adults the same. I tell them the same thing. Uh, and I've had people I've sat down and interview. I tell them go someplace else. There's nothing thing for you. Yeah, because they there's a lot of emphasis on the mixed martial arts and yes. the and then the yes. fighting, yes. And, and that's just not what we do here. And they know it's a fighting art. Yeah. So you know, people will bring their children in. Somebody picked on them in school, and they want to. Just mess. It's not what you want to do. Yeah. 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 But that's that's mainly what I try to impress upon sure. people. At this based with the character builder, and I also mentioned the uh, dojo kun. Mm. I said we do this after every event, whether it's a tournament, whether it's a class. That's we right. say it over and over. Hopefully, it becomes ingrained. Mm -hmm. Now, Fareed's still is since he's four years old. Fareed is a fighter. Right? He's my first love, yeah. and I enjoy him. Mm -hmm. You know, we enjoy each other. He's he's uh, always been a good. Never had any problems with him, and uh, it's just it's yeah. a mutual. Yeah. yeah. What's it been like to kind of grow in your karate together with your yeah. son? Yes. What's that been like? Yes. Is, I guess it's just a great blessing that you've been able to experience. Yeah. Well, I'm kind of curious too when I think about, um, you know, for free his training and he's, you know, you both reached your very high levels, but I know there's a tough relationship of parent to child in karate. It's, mm -hmm. it's a very hard relationship to manage. And so I know sometimes, again, back to like the Japanese culture, my understanding is that, you know, in Japanese culture, you would, a parent might assign their child, oh no, your uncle's gonna teach you this. Right. They would assign it out. What what role, how, what role did you have in like Fareed's development? Was it, were you, again, primarily the person kind of leading through or, or, or did you um, kind of seek ways to, you know, have other people you know, make sure they were influencing him in karate, or I guess I'm kind of asking to how, how much, um, you know, responsibility do you, do you take in terms of his karate right. development? I just, I really just sort of left him on his own. Yeah. We were trained, for example, <laughs> an incident, uh, downtown dojo, uh, that fellow George Cunyon, he's on that picture in there. Uh, yeah. George was like a six, two, 200 pounder. And Fareed was the only child in the dojo, so, uh, the guys, some of the men after after class, they'd get him on the floor and, and they would beat on him a little bit, you know, trying to temper him up. And one day, uh, Mr. Cunyon did something to him. I don't know what he did, but uh, we were all dressed and standing outside waiting. For he was in the back, and I called him. I said, "Come on, man, let's go." He said, "Wait a minute, wait a minute, Dad." And uh, Cunyon was changing his clothes, and he stood there and watched Cunyon. Cunyon picked his foot up, put his pants on. He walked up behind me, kicked him with a mic, here he drove him into the wall, and ran, took all the things on the ground. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't get him to do it for a month. He said, no, I just want to make that decision. Cunning, you're going to get me. He said, I'm not going to bother you. <laughs> he, was he was angry, it was revenge for the person. Yeah, for yeah, the he, yeah he, he beat up on him a little bit in the dojo. Mm -hmm. yeah. They would punch him, not hurt him, but yeah, you know, yeah, they would yeah. sweep him sometimes, yeah. stuff like that. They don't want to tough him up. Yeah. And he would just get his revenge the best way he could. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. funny. And he and Okazaki since they had a kind of special relationship. Yeah, yeah. Because we started with him, he's seven years old. Mm -hmm. So I asked you about what advice do you give new students? What about for the person who's been training a long time? Like, uh, Yeah, maybe if, you see, uh, if there's any you know, senior students that you, know, you, you train for a while, you kind of hit maybe the doldrums, or you hit periods where um, if someone's, um, you know, not doesn't need the test and isn't competing, sometimes motivation like lacks. You know, would you have suggestions for people if they've been training a long time and they're, um, you know, still trying to find that, you know, trying to find what their new motivation is for training? Uh, do you have any, you know, advice or, or things that that have kind of helped you continue to push yourself, even when you know after a while, if, if you're not trying to test again or people aren't competing. Some people struggle with what what their motivations is. Well I I, I have actually sat down with people. When I see them see them uh, seem to be going off in that direction, I'll sit yeah. down with them and try to find out if there's something in their personal lives or mm -hmm. what if the job, whatever it might be that is, is bothering them, mm -hmm. I'll try to help them through it if I can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I try to find out exactly what's bothering them. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not always successful in doing that. I've always had also had to reprimand some people. Mm. I do have one question, but I'm not sure if there's any way for you to know this. 
if you had to guess how many students you've taught over the years, just ballpark, I mean, because we know just the just from training here, we see people come in to stop in to visit you and, and you introduce them to us and, you know, they've started as their children and now they're older than we are. And I mean, your influence just um, goes, I know you're a very humble man, but like anyone we talk to you about you, it's just, they just sing your praise and, um, they say, tell stories about how you've helped them personally or through your pedagogy training. Can, is there any way to put a number on how many students that you've taught? Well, we have a numbering system. Okay. And uh, I can't tell you how many I've taught, but all the people who've tested, I still have cards on them. Okay. Most part. And we're over 2,000 now. Okay. Wow. So That's if we've tested that yeah. many, yeah. then the, those who have come and not tested, uh, sure. so maybe another 1,000 to that. And we started, I think, my number, Elliot's number is 14, I believe. Oh, wow. Mine is three or four, something like that. Ours is mm -hmm. a single number. And now we, uh, I think the highest number we have is 2,021 coming to. Wow. And I remember, and I'm not sure because I had to excuse myself a couple times with the kids, but did we talk about when your name changed? Did you start? No, we did not. Did you start Karate as? Um, Santa Jones, or yes. did you start? Okay. Yes, started Santa Jones. Uh, Elijah Muhammad died in 1975, and when his son took over, he uh, started making changes and took us to what you might call Orthodox Islam. Okay. okay. And uh, he published a book of names, mm -hmm. and he asked us, those of us who wanted to, who didn't acquire it, to sit down, review that book of names, take your time, go over it. So we hired a lawyer, we sat down, it took us maybe six or seven months, it's going over the books. And names of boys, names of girls, surnames. For me, it means unique. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of some of his accomplishments as a, as a youngster, uh, we, we gave him that name. Uh, Manan means kind and gentle, and mine is generous. Mm -hmm. So those are the names that we took. And mm -hmm. uh, we went to the lawyer, and we had all of our documents changed. And some of the people just use the names and don't change them, you know. I see. Uh, okay. Yeah, but we felt yeah. that it's best to do that. Yeah. So we didn't change them all the way, but that's what, that's what gave us the incentive to do that. Wow. Yeah, cool. Um, and on, in fact, made Hajj. Mm -hmm. In 1989, she went to Saudi Arabia. Oh, yeah, I remember Free told me that story. Yeah. Yeah. We, we both couldn't go. Mm -hmm. I was going to go because the man usually goes first, mm -hmm. but she kind of <laughs> talked me into letting yeah. her go first, so, so yeah. she went. It was really funny because she was gone, I think, three or four weeks. Mm -hmm. And I, I, went, I was a cook. <laughs> she got a back free and said, I was so tired of eating eggs. <laughs> and, and, and sausage, not sausage, we didn't eat meat, so uh, eggs and, and uh, French toast. Mm -hmm. That was my friend. <laughs> I'm so tired of eating eggs and French toast. And so, but she prepared meals for us uh -huh. and froze them. Yeah. But that was the breakfast. I would cook breakfast, and we always either French toast, yeah. eggs, yeah. Uh, something simple to cook. Cause I, I still can't cook. Oh, <laughs> oh boy, that's kind of how the transition came about. The, yeah. the main change. Yes. Yeah. I remember um, before we were students of your club. I remember seeing you at Don exams and seeing you at tournaments. And I remember Manon was always there as well, yes. and she was always just very. As um, her name, her name means kindness, you yes, know, and, yes, and it was just a very suitable name for her. And yes. I remember, you know, her at her desk, and we would come in, and she was just so so sweet, and yes. you know, just just a part, just a part of the club, just like anyone else. She was else. a very warm person. Yeah. Yes, yes. And did, didn't she train as well? Did she do some? She training? got to to yellow belt, orange, orange okay. belt. Okay. Yeah, and she uh, same for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but she had other interests as well because okay. she was. Very active in the mosque. That's what I thought. Yeah. Uh, yes. So uh, uh, she, she had, later on, she said she wished she had not stopped what she, she had been doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's been a journey. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I've enjoyed it immensely, and I hope to be able to do it a few more years. And I have good rapport with most of the people yeah. in the organization, yeah. so you know. Yeah. I've enjoyed that too. That's one of the things I always look forward to. We have tournaments and things like that. It's like family get together. Absolutely. Right? It's a yes. reunion of sorts. Well, Sitsi, thank you. Thank you again for your time. I think one of the reasons we are 
you know, the other examples I think you show is just your your ability to still be teaching and training. I think is something that I hope people take from take as an example from you that you know you're, you're never too old to keep moving. Yeah. If you keep moving your body, your yeah. body will still you know, be able to kind of do what you ask of it. And I think that's kind of a final or closing question in terms of I don't know longevity. When I think about um, uh, Funik Master Funikoshi's um, book or his autobiography, My Way of Life, and right. that seemed to be one of his the big things that he, you know, reasons he wanted to spread the, the arc was right. that he thought it, it aided his own health. Absolutely. You know, yes. I mean, I didn't know if, you know, to what degree, um, you know, you felt, you know, that was uh, a secret to, to your, you know, kind of health and do you have any kind of final thoughts in terms of, um, you know, what, what, what can we do, how can we use karate to um, keep us healthy and keep us going? Karate in and of itself would be better. Yeah. Just, just keep, you know, uh, I think, Diet is important, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. uh, but uh, good diet, good attitude, good thinking, yeah. uh, all those things combined right. and, uh, are well. well we, we love training here, I think, because it kind of gives us this really great motivation that we, because we love doing this and we want to do it as long as we can, and so I think training at this club and having great examples around us gives us that motivation that as long as we keep training, we can keep doing it. So. We're just well, trying, to, trying to keep up with everyone yeah. here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we sort of... Uh, I guess inadvertently, or however you want to say it, but we sort of develop a reputation. I think we have. Uh, I think Reed is largely responsible for that, mm -hmm. the way he teaches. Mm -hmm. But I know one time we had something here and somebody came from as far away as Denver, I believe. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, the women's Shia. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that's and, and I think that's what's unique about us, too, is like we, we don't charge anything. Right. You know, people yeah. are, we just welcome them as a part of the family. And so and I think that's a big part of, like, again, going back to your. Your um, what your name means, you know, your generosity yes. of the welcoming people yes. into you know your home. This is well, your everybody. Home. Everything's about money these days. Yeah. And, you know, as long as I can pay the bills, I'm satisfied. You know, yeah. I tell people when they come, nobody gets salary. Mm -hmm. I'm not salary. No. The only thing I do once in a while, I'll buy some gas. Yeah. Some yeah. Gas or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't get yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. Yeah. Good. All right. Yeah. It's a journey. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. We're done.